Hi, I'm Delila Dodge, breast surgeon at Penn State Health. Today, we are going to quickly review breast cancer risk factors and staging, but we will largely focus on the management of the axilla. A 40-year-old female presents with a palpable mass in her right breast. Where do you start with her evaluation? Whenever we assess a breast patient, we need to start with a good history so we can assess their risk. We want to know about their complaint. Do they have pain, skin changes, nipple discharge, any recent trauma? If there's a lump, how long it's been there? But we also are going to bring in age, race, and other risk factors such as alcohol consumption and smoking. We really need to know about their personal history of any kind of breast problems, previous biopsies, and especially a personal history of breast cancer. We don't want to forget about radiation. Chest wall radiation significantly increases the risk of breast cancer and has been given to patients who have had Hodgkin's disease. We want to do a really good delve into family history, looking for any history of cancer. Breast and ovarian are very important, but we also want to know about the history of colon cancer, uterine cancer, stomach cancers, and particularly cancers that occur at a young age. We want to be alert to breast cancer associated deleterious mutations such as BRCA1 and 2 or the CHECK2 mutation and even Lynch syndrome which we all associate with colon cancer can be associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. We also want to look at their hormonally related risk factors. So we ask about age of menarche and if they're already menopausal we want to know their number of pregnancies, age at first life birth, whether or not they breastfed, how long they breastfed, whether they used oral contraceptives, any hormonal replacement therapy, or infertility hormone use is also relevant. We look at the time of exposure to hormones by gauging these factors. When doing a physical examination, remember you want to do a standard physical examination and check heart and lungs. When we do the breast exam, I really strongly advocate that you do your exam both in a sitting and in a supine position. You really want to have a good feel of the nodal basins, the axillary, supraclavicular, and cervical regions. You want to examine the breast and look at it upright. You're going to feel the upper part of the breast better in that upright position. And then when the patient lies down and puts their arm above their head, you're going to get a much better feeling of the lateral and inferior breast. You're going to look for any skin umbilication. You're going to look to express a nipple discharge. You're going to get an idea of the size of the mass if there is one and whether it's mobile, whether it's irregular or whether it's smooth. Case continued. The patient noticed the palpable mass about a week ago in the shower. She hasn't had any other symptoms. Her only risk factors are her young age and early menarche at nine years old. On physical exam, she's a C cup with the only abnormal findings being a three centimeter palpable immobile mass in the right upper outer quadrant and a two centimeter palpable node in her axilla. What are the next steps in her evaluation? We always want to start by ordering a diagnostic mammogram. Remember that a diagnostic mammogram includes multiple views if necessary, and the radiologist can perform ultrasound as well. This allows them to fully assess the sign or symptom that the patient is presenting with. It's also important to review BIRAD scoring. Remember that a BIRAD zero means that there's further workup that needs to be done. The difference between BIRADS one and BIRADS two is that in BIRADS one, there are no findings. And in BIRADS two, there is a benign finding. A BIRADS-3 gives us about a 2% chance that there might be a malignancy, but a 98% chance that they believe that this is a normal finding, and so six-month follow-up is perfectly acceptable. BIRADS-4 tells us that we need to do a biopsy. There's a 2 to 95% chance of there being a malignancy. And when a radiologist reads out BIRADS-5, they're saying they're convinced to a greater than 95% certainty that this is a cancer. The patient mammogram shows a speculated mass with an enlarged axillary lymph node. Now that you have these concerning findings on imaging, what do you do next?
So your patient asks you to cut out the mass and your answer is no. Excisional biopsy should not be performed when we're suspicious of a cancer. The answer is core biopsy. Core biopsies provide information and enough information for us to subtype the cancer. We learn the tumor grade, hormone receptor status for estrogen and progesterone, and the HER2 status. We also learn the histologic subtype, and then we can understand whether this is an aggressive or a more favorable cancer. The normal breast cell has receptors on it for estrogen and progesterone. So when it loses this differentiation, the more de-differentiated a cancer is, the more aggressive it is. And we also know that patients whose tumors are HER2 positive are far more likely to metastasize. We get a core needle biopsy and the results come back and show a grade three invasive ductal carcinoma of the breast that's ER and PR negative and HER2 positive. Ultrasound of the axilla, which as a reminder is a part of the diagnostic mammogram, shows a suspicious enlarged lymph node with loss of the lymph node hilum and a thickened cortex measuring two centimeters. What do we do next? So we know she has a biologically aggressive cancer with a clinically positive lymph node. We're going to document whether or not that node is positive with another core biopsy. If the lymph node is documented as positive, she's going to need metastatic screening, which would include CTs of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as well as a bone scan. We also want to send her to the genetics counselor for genetic testing because of her young age, the time of onset. We actually find that many of our patients who turn out to have a deleterious mutation don't necessarily have a strong family history of breast or ovarian cancer. Once you've completed your biopsy and your metastatic workup, do you go to the operating room right away? So the first thing we wanna do is present this patient at a multidisciplinary tumor board. This is going to include not only surgeons, but medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, or genetics counselors, and we're going to review her x-rays with one of the radiologists present, and we're also going to review her pathology slides, and then talk about the optimal management for this patient's cancer. By the way, her metastatic workup was happily negative. We've now staged her. She's a clinical stage 2B, a T2, N1, M0. We know that she is high grade, hormone receptor negative, and HER2 positive. Her genetic testing results are still pending. Remember that the new AJCC breast cancer staging is based not only on the size of tumor and whether there's lymph node involvement or metastatic disease, but also includes tumor grade, estrogen, progesterone receptor status, and HER2 status. So that's quite a bit to keep track of. So is it okay to reference the AJCC staging manual regularly? I do. Great, that's reassuring. So the medical oncologist at our tumor board discussion recommends neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then they give her TCHP. She returns three months later. Her palpable mass and axillary lymph node completely disappeared after the second course of chemotherapy. Repeat imaging shows no residual mass, and no abnormal lymph nodes in the axilla. That's wonderful. She's achieved an imaging PCR, pathologic complete response. Exactly. Now that the patient responded to chemotherapy, what operation would you consider? This is the point at which we have a discussion with the patient regarding her choice of breast conservation versus mastectomy. She is a candidate for either. She had a unifocal cancer in a single quadrant. She's responded well to her therapy. She doesn't have any disease anywhere else. And so we can offer her breast conserving treatment. We also discuss the option of mastectomy. Okay. She elects for breast conserving therapy. Do we need to still do a full axillary dissection since she initially had a positive node? No, we don't. And this is one of the great advantages of neoadjuvant chemotherapy because not only can we assess the tumor and its responsiveness to the systemic therapy, but if we downstage the axilla, 
this patient now becomes a candidate for sentinel lymph node biopsy. We don't know that we're not going to do a full axillary dissection. What we know is that they're a candidate potentially for a sentinel lymph node biopsy. This patient's going to need dual technique if they have sentinel lymph node biopsy using both the radioisotope and a blue dye. The radioisotope needs to be injected the night before surgery to give more time for it to localize as the disrupted lymphatics after neoadjuvant chemotherapy can cause a problem with localization. Some of these patients won't localize at all. The blue dye will be given the morning of surgery in the operating room usually at the time of surgery. I'm so excited about the uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy that we haven't really talked about the primary breast surgery as well. So that is a partial mastectomy. We need to have localization. That can be done with several different techniques. There's wire localization. We use Savvy Scout here. There's Endomag, which is a different localization technique. And then there's radioactive seeds. It's surgeon's choice. But we have to find the area where the cancer was before. Then the sentinel lymph node biopsy is performed. And I also like to combine it with what's called targeted axillary dissection. I want to assure myself that this patient, if they don't have evidence of metastatic disease on frozen section, the node that was positive, that we knew was positive, was removed as well. That's what the targeted axillary dissection refers to. So we do the sentinel nodes and we x-ray them looking for the clip. And if that clip that was placed at the time of the biopsy is present and those nodes are negative, that's when we can avoid doing the axillary dissection and stop. Okay, so you've taken the patient to the operating room and you find three sentinel lymph nodes and one is the targeted node. Do we need to do anything with them in the operating room? Absolutely. We need to send them to the pathologist for assessment, looking for any metastatic disease in any of these lymph nodes. If all the nodes are negative, the patient does not need an axillary lymph node dissection. However, if any tumor is found in any of the lymph nodes, a full axillary dissection, that includes both level one and two, should be performed. So for these patients, how many lymph nodes do we need to be sure to get while we're in the operating room? Is there a minimum, like in colorectal cancer? Well, we want to have three nodes, if possible, because in 1071, uh, the study that first assessed whether sentinel lymph node biopsy could be done in these neoadjuvant patients, to get a false negative rate of under 10%, you have to have three sentinel nodes. Okay, three nodes it is. Do you have any intraoperative tips we should keep in mind that relate to the axilla? When we're operating in the axilla, we have to remember that this is the source of most of the acute and chronic pain that these patients have. We know about the long thoracic and the thoracodorsal nerves, and they are important motor nerves, but we don't want to forget the intercostobrachial nerve. This is a sensory nerve that crosses the axilla in transverse manner, and it is fairly superficial. So even when you're doing a sentinel node, if you really retract hard on this nerve or if you actually divide it, then the patient is going to end up with a numb medial arm and can have some long-standing paresthesias and pain. Okay, so exciting news. Touch prep shows all the nodes are negative and include the targeted node. And you complete the surgery. What post-operative concerns might you want to keep in mind for these patients? Well, with any operation, you have to remember there are potential complications. Hematoma, seroma, numbness, Motor injuries from those nerves that we just talked about are all things that we want to watch out for. And if you had to do a full axillary dissection, you would have left a drain. But when we just do a sentinel node, we generally don't drain the patient, but we do have to watch for that seroma, which sometimes requires drainage. If we had done a full axillary dissection, there's a risk for our lymphedema too, correct? Actually, there's a risk for lymphedema even if we just do a sentinel node. But if we do just a sentinel node, it's at the rate of about 2 to 4% versus a full axillary dissection, it's 20 plus percent. 
Now you get the final pathology back and it shows two millimeter residual metastasis and one lymph node. What do we do now? Do we need to get right back into the operating room for an axillary dissection? So we have a trial called Amaros and it looked at just these types of patients and it randomized them between a full axillary dissection and radiation of the axillary nodes and, and nodal basins. And what they found was no difference in disease-free survival or overall survival. But in those patients who were treated with radiation, they had a lower incidence of lymphedema. So most people will recommend the radiation unless there's suspicion for additional nodes. Do remember that if that metastasis was identified at the time of surgery, there is no role for not doing that full axillary dissection. If you find residual disease on final pathology, what are your next steps in management? So our patient failed to get a pathologic complete response, small amount of residual disease, and we know she's going to have an expanded radiation field to cover the axillary nodes. But we're also going to change her systemic therapy. In patients who fail to get a pathologic complete response with Herceptin and Progetta, we have a new HER2-targeted agent, TDM1, trade name Kedsyla, which is able to salvage another 20% of the patients who fail to get a pathologic complete response. She would start that and she would take that drug for a full year. What does the surveillance regimen look like for this patient? She's going to need to have a clinical examination by one of her physicians at least every six months. Generally, we rotate this among specialists. She's going to need mammography once a year. Not more frequently, like every six months? That's been looked at carefully, and there's no benefit to more frequent mammography. However, as she has heterogeneously dense breasts, we could add MRI the alternating six months to her regimen. So she'd be getting mammo and six months later, MRI. Now that you've worked through this lecture with us, what are your key takeaways? We hope you remember that core biopsy is critical for biologic subtyping before any surgical intervention. In HER2 positive breast cancers, targeted therapy has transformed outcomes and often should be given preoperatively. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy and N1 disease can allow the patient to undergo sentinel lymph node biopsy rather than axillary dissection, decreasing risk of associated morbidities. If there is any residual nodal disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the patient will require treatment with either axillary dissection or irradiation, and potentially a change in chemotherapy regimen. That's a wrap on the management of the axilla in breast cancer. Please let us know what thoughts and questions you might have. This video cast was created and edited by Ray Hankey and Dalila Dodge in collaboration with Stay Current General Surgery.